You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I also knew never to declare that I was a gypsy at school because it come with a stigma, liars, tramps and thieves. And I think we have to accept stereotypes are out there and they're just a form of abuse tomorrow it can all change today i could lose it all we never know what's going to happen the same ladder we've climbed is the same ladder you slip down success is a journey a categorically a journey and we never know if we're successful till we've reached the last breath then we can say Yes, we lived a successful life. I don't believe there is such thing as a bad business, just bad people that run them. That's why one estate agent on one side of the road can be thriving, the other one across the road can be closing. It's not the business, it's the people. Life carves you, and it's the deepest cuts, it's the chunks that get cut out of you, that scar you, that make you the person you are. And it will either make you a masterpiece or it will make you this horrible, misshapen, bitter, twisted piece of wood. And that's what life can do. It's up to you to make sure those cuts, what's being cut and carved out of you, are turning you into a masterpiece. Every time I tell this story, I have hairs come up on the back of my neck and uh, it, it puts a cold... puts a, a cold light through my body. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Alfie Best. Alfie, this is mine, James. Absolute pleasure, brother. So you've got the tagline, Britain's richest gypsy. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Where is he then? <laughs> is, uh, are you okay with that tagline? I, I feel like they've written poorest gypsy most days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, first and foremost, thanks again for coming on the show. We tried last week. I got locked out of the, the studio, mate, which was a nightmare. I'm usually on the ball with those things. But again, thanks for giving me your time. No, no, no. Listen, it's a shame I couldn't get us in because, you know, you should always bring any key, especially a pie key. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, but again, it's just, you've got a phenomenal story for success. I've met your son, Alfie Jr., like, a great kid, man, like, Thank head you. screwed on, very polite. Um, again, it has podcast about, both podcasts about in the same week, but you've raised a good one there, and he's very well liked. Everybody speaks very highly of him, and he should be proud. Thank you. Um, I am proud. Um, there's no guidelines or books to how we bring our kids up. Sometimes you think you're doing it right and sometimes you think you're doing it wrong and sometimes I think he's bringing me up, um, you know, but we have a good relationship uh, in the point that I wouldn't say that we're particularly very close, but what we are is we're close enough in the way that I think he values my opinion now more than, say, he did many years ago and to be fair, it's at the point now where I value his opinion. So for that point, I think I've done all right. Yeah. I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Um, do you know, uh, there's nothing really magical or, or about my story. And it's no different to a lot of other people's story. Um, it's how we tell them. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm a traveller. I'm a gypsy. I was born in a place called Lutterworth. <clears throat> my mum and dad loved cars and lorries so I was born on the side of the road <laughs> I think they like the trucks going by um, and you know from there on I had a fabulous mum and dad um, I've been very blessed with the love care that I had from them um, were we poor only in a financial uh, mindset as for uh, everything else, I didn't think we were poor. In actual fact, um, I think this is a mindset of most survivors from 
difficult backgrounds. And when I say difficult backgrounds, what I mean is I never really understood what it meant by being born into a privileged background. Um, I do now. And I think sometimes it can be a blessing to be born into a privileged background. And sometimes it can be a curse because if you're born into a privileged background, you assume that's the norm. When in actual fact, it's not. You know, the norm is really, to be fair, if you think that there is, I think, 7 billion people on this planet and last calculation, there is 1,500 billionaires. That's a minute amount when you think of the the amount of people in the population in the world. So it shows that for me, when I look at it, I see so many people that are not born, um, shall we say, from good privileged backgrounds that are going to give them a great education or a great start. I had a great start from a different world. My mum and dad supported me along my way. So I, for me, as hard as it was, I didn't think it was a difficult background. You know, my mum and dad were still cooking on pots and pans outside on an outside fire. We'd done that up until I was 14 or 15, but it was the norm. Mm -hmm. No education. I know a lot of travellers didn't really go to school as well, but some did, some left early on. But what about yourself? Ever go to school, Alfie? Yeah, yeah. I went to school, but it was periodic. It was like on and off. And the one school that I did actually go to was where we wintered. My mum and dad had a yard uh, in a place called Wormley. And we'd go back there for the winter and I'd go to school then. But school was very periodic. You know, um, I certainly am not a scholar and I can't read and write that well. But, you know, social media and the internet has certainly helped, I think, a lot of people that um, skill set academically isn't that good has actually brought them on because we've all, we're all now texting everybody, even people that can't read and write. Mm are actually being brought on by it. Yeah. What about your relationship with your mum and dad? Was it a close relationship or was it tough love? My mum, definitely tough love. My mum is a very hard woman. Um, you know, the, you look at my dad. My dad's a man six foot four and my mum's a, a woman five foot one. They're like, you know, little and large. But my mum has got a heart like a lion. But I was brought up, if I got in a fight, and you didn't hit back, you got beat. But I don't mean you just got a backhander, you got beat. Do I think that was the right way? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. Because I think uh, I never ever got bullied at school. And I never ever, um, but I, having said that, I also knew never to declare that I was a gypsy at school because it come with a stigma, liars, tramps and thieves. And I think... We have to accept stereotypes are out there and they're just a form of abuse. No different than calling somebody ugly or fat or... It's just abuse. How was that to deal with? Um, look, coming from a gypsy background, we think we're smart. We really think there isn't a gypsy that you'll ever meet or a traveller you ever meet that doesn't think they're sharp. And do you know something? That's because they all are. Because if I was starving and I was on a desert island, there's only one man I want to be with, and that's another gypsy. Because I know we're climbing that coconut tree and we're getting the coconuts down. It's having to is a great master. And what gypsies do is they survive and thrive, and they've done that all over the world. And that's... Because always the travelling community are always earning from a very young age... Where does that get ingrained in? Is that because it's just survival mode or is it just to learn to earn for yourself? Like Every, if you think of the Americans, when America was first populated, it was populated, whether you take it was Irish, whether you take it was Italian, whether you take it was English, it was populated by immigrants. And all those immigrants had to become entrepreneurs. So gypsies and travellers are born 
entrepreneurs. They're born to thrive, not only just survive. Is that was that hard to try and learn trades from a very young age, especially with lack of schooling, lack of reading and writing? Like, how did you adapt and how did you manage to adapt and learn? If you don't know mm -hmm. and you're learning on the tools, it can't be hard, can it? When people say, oh, how difficult must that have been because, you know, your academic skills weren't, well, that's like saying, you know, God forgive, a man that's born blind uh, needs to be able to see to get around the room. You adapt. You don't know any different. I certainly didn't know any different, so I learned on the tools. And learning on the tools is a way we, we learn. Just because society says... You have to go to school. You have to be educated in this formal way. You then take your degree. You then go out there and become successful. In what format? In the format that they say that we're successful? And I don't agree with that. I actually think that our schooling system is broken. And the reason I say that it's broken is this, look... When you learn to take your driving test, your, you know, for your car or your van or whatever, they don't just give you your theory, fill out your documentation and say, there's the keys, go and drive the car. You have to do the theory, then you do the practical with an instructor sitting at your side while you learn to drive the car. They do that with every machine, whether it's a helicopter, an aeroplane, that's what but yet with a school, they let you take your GCSEs or your O-levels or whatever exam it is and then give you the keys to the wide world and say, go out there and conquer it. Hold on, shouldn't it be a mix of both? Shouldn't it be a mix of doing the theory, which is your exam, and then putting you into the real world piece by piece and it should be paired together? What was the first earner you had? The first? Earner. First earner I ever had. Good question. Taking a job at eight years old, taking the top of a tree of a uh, taking the top of a monkey tree out, which my dad climbed and took out. And a monkey tree is like what they call a monkey puzzle tree, and that was in Winchmore Hill. I remember that. I got thirty quid, and I thought it was all the money in the world. See, at that moment is that when you realised. I wanted to make more or was it just so young that it was nothing? I don't think I understood it then. Mm -hmm. The man that changed my life um, where money was concerned was when I was 13, I took a job tarmacking off of a man called Mr. Hambro um, from the Hambro's family, Hambro's Trust, Hambro's Pension in Harpenden at the Harpenden Estate. And I got paid £31,000 to tarmac about a mile of road, which at that time, in like 1983, was just unheard of. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Master Best. Because he didn't think I was 13, he thought I was 18. <laughs> he said, Master Best, he said, you're wasted. He said, why don't you, he said, come to work on the estate with me. And I thought he was just an eccentric old fool of a man. What I realised, I was the young, undereducated fool because if I'd have foregone any money and learnt from somebody of his calibre who took a liking to me then, I'd be a hell of a lot further forward than I am now because it's fine saying I've done well now. I've not done well. And I'm not successful. I'm successful at this point in my life. Tomorrow, it can all change. Today, I could lose it all. We never know what's going to happen. The same ladder we've climbed is the same ladder you slip down. Success is a journey, a categorically a journey. And we never know if we're successful till we've reached the last breath. Then we can say, Yes, we lived a successful life, not before. So when you're getting those jobs at 13 and, and doing your thing and making dough, like, is it just keep going? Is it, or is it survival mode or is it investing? Like, how did 
those entrepreneurial ships, how did those come into your mind? Like, have you always been like that? Have you always a, a stick out to go? Success, money is a drug. Mm -hmm. And it's an endorphin that gets released in all of our minds. If you are, you know, think of, and I say this, if you think of a job, just a normal job, where you get the day, what's the best day that we look forward to? It's payday. Mm -hmm. That's no different than taking a job, knocking on a door. What's the best part of that job? Finishing it and getting paid. So it's an endorphin release. And what, one of the things that I did, at the time I had a nationwide building society book. And I didn't realise it at the time, but I was creating a saving habit. Because I started making sure that I paid money into my building society book every day every single day and all of a sudden i'd get withdrawal symptoms if i didn't go in and pay something into that book and it's only when you reflect back on it you realize what you did is created the 28 day reoccurrence habit and by creating that habit of making sure whether you pay a pound in you just make sure that you do it every day at the same time and it becomes imprinted in your brain like muscle memory and then the hardest thing to do is to change from a saver to an investor and once you then manage the skill set to invest and you get whatever you're investing in to produce a revenue stream well then you've cracked it because you're making the age old the age old prophecy of being come of becoming wealthy and what that is is making money while you sleep did you visualize any of that did you have no, that in your the, routine daily not, not at the time mm -hmm. it has been a process of where i've looked at what other people have done and studied what successful people have done and looked at what works don't try to reinvent the wheel don't try to reinvent what success is for other people. You know, if we look at some of the most successful things in the world, they've never been changed. What's the most successful thing that we can possibly think of? It's the wheel. Success and it's leaves still clues. going round. Success leaves clues. Yeah. I always remember reading, I think it was Think and Grow Rich. And uh, I think it was Napoleon Hill. Um, and that's what he says. He says the 500 richest people on the planet are the 50th. And they all had the same patterns. They all had the same patterns, their daily routine. Their routine yeah. was everything that made them who they were. They never broke the routine, no matter how good or bad their day was. Systems and process. Systems and process. It's like a mechanical engine. Systems and process. Systems and process. And what they're doing is then just kicking off revenue. As them processes... If you have to get up and change your routine every day, which we have to change different things because you have to adapt to different situations. But if the core mechanics of the business that you're in has to reinvent itself every day, how on earth can it have a system that produces money? It must be repetition, continuous. It's like a giant machine just churning through the earth. What was your first business, Alfie? Um, obviously selling tarmac, knocking on doors. But my first real business mm -hmm. was um, buying and selling commercial vehicles. And what I used to do was go to, um, first auction that I went to was Enfield Auction. And I used to buy four-wheel drive vehicles. And the four-wheel drive vehicles I'd send to another auction in Wales, auction called Merthyr Tidfield, Merthyr Motor Auctions. Because four-wheel drive vehicles were wanted in places that needed them, like, you know, farmers and X, Y, Z. And when I was at Merthyr Tidfield, I'd look for minis that were automatic. Or at the time, they were mini metros that were auto. Because, and I'd send them back to London. Because in London, they always wanted an automatic car. So it's about, same old thing, supply and demand, but more so where the product is needed. And you'd make a small amount of profit, 
but I'd be doing it five, six times a day. And how was that then? Was that a get in for you to then jump on the car trade? What it was is I would go as far to say one of the hardest businesses that I've ever been involved in. Why is that? Because you were investing your money and you didn't really know what you were buying. It was going through an auction and you didn't know what state it was in. You had to make an assessment of what that vehicle was like. And the reason that I didn't never ever pull them out and try and sell them to the general public is because as a dealer, you were responsible. And I couldn't be responsible that I didn't know it anything you know i didn't live yeah. with it or whatever so i made the choice that i was going to be a trader and that trader is no different than buying stocks and shares only it's a physical product did you ever obviously you're going to make mistakes that's part of life like, did you ever get fucked over when you thought not again yeah, of course buying a shady car and this, you drove out and yeah, the engines yeah. fucking fell yeah. out of it. i actually bought a petrol uh, a petrol transit that was knocking um, and if anybody doesn't understand what that means, it's like when the camshaft is going. And I thought I bought a diesel. Put the wrong petrol in. <laughs> I thought I bought a diesel, <laughs> but it was actually a petrol transit. Uh, how, did you have business partners or anything in, or were you just flying solo? No, no, I was flying solo. How is that? Um, terrifying sometimes. But what I would say to you is, it's fine having a partner. And it's great sometimes to bounce things off. Uh, it is because I've had several partners. Luckily, most of my partnerships have been good partnerships. Um, the best advice I can give somebody about having a partner mm -hmm. is uh, in business is don't have a partner because you like him. Have a partner because he brings a great skill set to that business. Because the only conversation you should be having with a business partner is not about going down the pub and having a drink. Or the football should be about the business. So you want to talk to somebody who's actually going to bring the business further up the ladder. Mm -hmm. How do you learn how to trust in the business game? Is that just by giving someone a chance? Or is that, how did you pick who oh. to trust? Because in business, people are ruthless. Since I've been legit, I've probably had more people try to fuck me over than I was when I was active back in the day. I have a policy that I run within all my businesses. I ask nobody to trust me. And I ask not to trust anybody else. Simple as that. I don't want to trust anybody. And I certainly don't want them to trust me. Mm -hmm. See, when you started making waves and started getting a lot of attention like, and becoming very successful and people knew who you were and how much money you had. Like, how hard is that f for you? Like, was it, does there come a lot of envy and jealousy with that? Or is a lot of people proud of what you're doing? Look, I think you're going to get envious, you're going to get jealous, and you're also going to get people that are proud, and you're going to get people that are, you know, are supportive of you. That just comes with all walks of life. You get that, but everybody gets that in one form or another. All of it is good for you, used in the right way, because if somebody's a little bit envious of you, it can help spur you on. If somebody's a little bit supportive of you, it can help spur you on. It's how you take it. Like I have a little saying that I use, which is we all have fears. They can either drown you or drive you. The choice is yours. I choose my fears to drive me. Whereas if you allow your fears to consume you, they can hold you back, stop you going out the front door. What makes you still get up in the morning to keep succeeding? Like You've got all the money in the world. Like, so for people saying that you're worth over a billion, like... What make, what gives you your drive then, I'll feel it? Because people hit a certain target and they just accept maybe a hundred grand, quarter of a million, they go, I'm happy with that, I can buy a flat, go a few holidays, like, what's the turn on then? But What does the turn on become? Fear. Fear? Fear. As I go back to what I said earlier, I'm on a journey. My journey is not complete and I'm not successful. I'm successful at this moment in time. Who knows what tomorrow brings? And let's not, re let's, you know, the worst thing you can do is start believing your own hype. Start believing your own bullshit because that's all it is. We're only borrowing everything we have. Every part of success, every asset that we own is borrowed. And that's only borrowed for a period of time. My job is to create as many soldiers 
and that's in the form of money and bring those soldiers in and then send those soldiers back out to conquer more soldiers and bring those soldiers back and then we send the soldiers back out to battle and the more soldiers you've got the easier the battles are to win what's your daily routine like Alfie? Um, I get up my alarm clock goes off normally about 6 or 6.30 I don't get up every morning at 6.30 but then I may get up at say five mornings at 6.30 I'll get up I'll have a wash I'll go for a run I'll either do 30 minutes or 20 minutes for a run I'll come back uh, washed shaved out the door and then it's an hour's drive to my office and for that solid hour I'll be on the phone hands free I must start uh, <laughs> on the phone constantly doing all of my calls I'll get to the office um, phone goes on silent. Then I'll work through all of my emails, clearing out the rubbish, blocking off people that have got my emails that shouldn't be emailing me with spam emails, and then replying to the ones that are important, and then rearranging them. So the emails that I need to be reminded about on a daily basis because it's a project that I'm working on, so they're still there, but they're arranged in order. Then I'll schedule out what deals and transactions that I'm working on. I'll go through, I'll make the calls to each of my team. Then if I feel that they're not getting the results that they should from the solicitors, surveyors, valuers, or whoever it is they're dealing with, I'll then pick up the phone with them copied in. So it will be a, a two-way call and ask why are they not being, because I don't want to have to do that again. Mm -hmm. My team are as important as me, if not more important. Then I'll leave the office and I'll go to each park. Maybe I'll do two or three visits um, and I'll go and visit the parks. The, and now that's on an average day. But on another day, I may go, be going and looking at a new deal. So I won't go to the office. I'll be driving out or I'll fly out with helicopter, whichever it is, depends how far it is away. Yeah. And I'll look at a new transaction. And then on another day, potentially I'll have some sort of meeting scheduled in like today when I've come to do this podcast with you, because I'm in central London, I've had four of my meetings all scheduled in for this day. So I get the use of the whole day. Mm -hmm. That's fucking mad. I'll feel that. You always, it isn't though. Yeah. Is it, you're always looking for the next hustle or cause you're constantly a business orientated which is clearly see that like you've got businesses you've got so much on the go that are you always looking for a next venture i'm looking to just succeed in what i'm doing i'm not looking uh to i'm not looking to be anything more than what you see i love what i do i'm empowered that i'm actually feel that i'm changing people's lives I'm creating the solution, not could be, not would be, am, to affordable homes. We're selling park homes at 50% less than you can buy like for like bricks and mortar. The government are against it. Why? Because it's not financially viable for them. There's no stamp duty. There's no land registration fee. The uh, council tax is banned A. Electricity on average is 28% cheaper. The list goes on. Mm -hmm. and people can sell their home and buy a new park home for approximately 50% or less, putting a lot of money in their pocket to live the dream. Is it for everybody? No. Do I make mistakes at it? Yes. I'm not perfect. But what I am doing is I'm being passionate about what I do. I love what I do. I'm driven at what I do. So... I can't ask for any more than that. I'm blessed. What made you get into that, Alfie? What was the decision to jump on the park homes? Who better to buy a caravan from than a gypsy? I've lived, <laughs> breathed. Simple as that. Yeah. I've lived, breathed, mm -hmm. and believe in the product. You know, don't sell something that you don't believe in. Don't sell something that you wouldn't use. I'd still be living in a park home today. No question about it. Regardless of the size of my house, I'd be living in a park home today. Um, if it wasn't for one reason. When I live on a park, it, 
all of a sudden I have no downtime because you've got a constant flow of residents still coming over to see you. And listen, not that I've got anybody coming over to see me, my residents or anybody, but we all need that shut off time sometimes. Yeah, to recharge. Yeah. What was it like buying your first park? Euphoric. Yeah? Euphoric. A good it, feeling? It, yeah. Euphoric. Like I'd conquered all my dreams and um, it was a park called Lakeview Park at Romford. It cost £1.7 million. It was in 1990. No, sorry, that's no, no, no. Two, it was in 2000 uh, that I bought it. It's 22 years ago, yeah, 2000. And it was all the money in the world. And I remember people saying that I'd lost my mind paying this amount of money um, for this uh, mobile home park. And I can only say that it was a euphoric feeling. Yeah. Felt like I'd made it in life. Was that the first proper time that you felt everything that you've worked hard for, working from the ages of eight to then investing big? Was that your biggest investment so far? It was definitely the biggest investment that I'd ever made. Mm -hmm. I can't say that it was, there was something more. It actually felt that I belonged and I'm really serious first business and I've done a number of other business from them from van hire to mobile phones um, to uh, uh, trading trucks around the country I've done several other businesses before that um, most of them successful not all of them um, but that was the first business that I can actually say to you touched my soul really is that because it was connected to what your upbringing was? I felt like I already knew it. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's like, the way I would describe it, it's like being a cyclist and then opening a bike shop. Mm -hmm. That's what it was like. How hard is that if somebody's telling you it's a bad idea, it's a bad investment, but you having the balls that you've got to then jump in and, and going for it anyway and then making it succeed? Uh, doubt is a horrible thing, but it's important to have. If somebody says to me, do I take advice? I take advice from everybody. And advice can come at the most difficult and different times. For instance... When I bought Lakeview Park, there was this resident that walked in. Lovely lady. She went, Mr. Best, what, what on earth made you buy this mobile home park? What a terrible investment, collecting some small pitch fees from all these residents. And I didn't say a word. But she didn't realise how powerful her advice was. Why? Because she'd missed the whole point of what she'd said. What a terrible investment it was to collect all these pitch fees from so many residents. Why would I want to do it? And it told me everything. It told me I was collecting small money from a lot of people, what nobody else wanted to do. Mm-hmm which was very successful. Do you see my point? Yeah. So she was telling me that a lot of people thought it was a bad thing to do, but they'd missed the whole point. If you want to be successful in life, monetary-wise, don't look to take a million pounds off of one person. Look to take a pound off of a million people. It's a lot easier to yeah. do. Because I've had, I had Joe Foster on a few weeks ago. He was the man who invented Reebok. Mm -hmm. Reebok wasn't it was doing okay but it wasn't doing great it was in America but there was nothing a man came up with an idea to create instead of a Reebok trainer to create the aerobic shoe aerobics was popping in LA, in LA he says no I don't know anything about aerobics don't be so daft the man says look please this is the next big thing 
And he says, no, I don't know anything about it. The guy ended up convincing him to make 200 or 1,000 shoes. they done it. They sold out in a day. Within three years, it was a billion dollar idea. Yeah, yeah, just... Just like that. It changed Reebok and became the biggest brand in the 80s and 90s. It's some, it's some fabulous stories that I've heard. Mm -hmm. Fabulous stories that um, they... I think about them all the time. And the most important thing is never, ever dismiss someone's opinion. They haven't got to accept it, but listen to it. Have you ever been spoke out of an idea? And you've kicked yourself later on? Mm, no, no. Is that because you're just so straight on? It's your decision, but if you feel it, you'll just go for it? Um... The businesses that I don't believe there is such thing as a bad business, just bad people that run them. That's why one estate agent on one side of the road can be thriving, the other one across the road can be closing. It's not the business, it's the people. One of the greatest stories um, that I love to tell is about a business of a guy down on his luck and he's walking along a Mexican beach and he sees this quite good looking pebble. But it is just an ordinary pedal. And he picks it up and he thinks, what a great business idea. He's going to sell pebbles. And what he did, he put a stone in a box and called it a pet stone. And drilled holes in the boxes and marketed it as the pet stone. And who he marketed it to was people that lived in flats that didn't want to keep a cat or a dog in a flat, but they wanted to give their kid a pet. So they bought them the pet stone in a box that was in like a little cage. He sold that business for 13 million a year after he started it. Mm. Crazy, eh? So an idea can be the wrong idea to the wrong person. It can be the right idea to the right person. Same as having the right information. You can have the right information at the wrong time. You can meet the right person at the wrong time in business or anything else. It's actually about bringing the two together. I've met loads of people at the wrong time. I've met some great people at the right time. And it was only learning that, you know, don't look to meet somebody who is the best person in their job when you're only actually starting out at that job. You need to meet the person at the next level at that job because you're not going to do a magnificent skyscraper jump and end up there. Success is a ladder mm -hmm. and it's one step at a time. What's it like to have a field business? Horrifying, soul-destroying, and even worse, when your personal life is on the line. And I've been there. I, I'm, I, every time I tell this story, I have hairs come up on the back of my neck and uh, it, it puts a cold, puts a, a cold light through my body. I, I had, um, I was 20 years old, 19 or 20 years old. I was in Forest Gate. And uh, I had a murmur, I collapsed across the desk. Before this happened, I was driving a brand new 911 convertible Porsche. I had a £550,000 house. I had a £350,000 van hire centre and four flats in a place called Palmerston Road. I was the echelon of success of a 20-year-old. I was a millionaire, self-made, and I looked the part felt the part and I thought I could walk on water I really did and it's funny how we tell a story and now I'm smiling because I think back to how I felt then and my god did I have a rude awakening and I realized I was just a baby in a crib waiting to have their bum slapped severely and many times because I I didn't understand what recessions were. It wasn't the recession's fault. I was bankrupt, but I didn't go bankrupt. And one of the worst things that happened to me 
is I had to sell the car. I had to move out the house. I had to rent the house out. I was lucky to do it. I had to move off the pitch, break it up into units. But I found a way of saving what I had. But the worst thing that happened to me was gone into a thing called negative equity. That's actually when your mortgage is more than your property is worth. And in that recession, people were just giving the keys back to the bank. And I never did that. I didn't do it. I thought through and thought, it's got to turn. It's got to turn. And it took years, it took two years, maybe three. And I moved out and I put a mattress in the back of an escort van and I slept in the back of the escort van for nearly three months. But I did what needs must. I did whatever it took. I did what I needed to do to get out. And I managed to get enough money together through the rents to cover the mortgage repayment. But the negative equity, what I thought was my downfall, was my saviour. Because if the banks have had any equity left in the property, they would have repossessed them. But because it, they would have had to have taken a bath on some money and I was paying the mortgage, they stayed in. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, that was the most difficult time of my life. And I can only say to you that... Um, had a defining effect on my life. What I would say to you is, people talk about life moulds you. Life doesn't mould you, not at all. That's a blessed way of putting it. Life carves you. And it's the deepest cuts, it's the chunks that get cut out of you, that scar you, that make you the person you are. And it will either make you a masterpiece or it will make you this horrible, misshapen, bitter, twisted piece of wood. And that's what life can do. It's up to you to make sure those cuts, what's being cut and carved out of you, are turning you into a masterpiece. Did that humble you? Yeah. 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 To yeah. being yeah. fairly big bollocks to then being homeless. Yeah. yeah. That turns you from the believe in your own hype Believe in what people are telling you. And do you know the worst thing about believing what people tell you all the time, how great you are and how good you are, is you start to believe your own decisions. You no longer ask people to question your decisions. And that's why I go back to, I ask nobody to trust me. Do you know why I ask nobody to trust me? Why? Because I'm not God. I get it wrong. And if I ask them to trust me, what I'm actually saying is, believe me. Well, I want them to check. I want them to check for me. Do you know why? The more people that seem to be checking for me, the less mistakes I make. Yeah. Do you feel any pressure on your life? I feel, because obviously I've spoke to you a few times now. You're very down to earth. You've taught me so much over the last... Like, usually I'm the one doing the talking, but I walked away from your conversation. I'm thinking, fuck me, like we sat in a cafe like, and just a couple of us chatting and you blew my mind with some of the stuff you, that you says. And I was, I was surprised that like, usually you think business orientated, but you spoke about a lot of kind of spiritual stuff and other stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, man, like it made me think. And it takes a lot uh, for people to do that with myself. Look, that's good of you to say. And I feel humbled by you saying that, but I'm no different than anybody else. All I have is an open mind. And I'm willing to take on anybody's view. Um, and because there's another little saying, a little mem that I have, the truth can become a lie spoken by the wrong person. In other words, it's how you're listening to it. It's how there are three, three sides to every story. Your side, their side, and the truth. Yeah. Because we all strum up how we see things in our own view. Because we actually see things differently. Mm -hmm. It's like when the police go and take a statement off of somebody and the two witnesses that were both standing there that are completely unbiased give two different versions. That's because they've both seen it differently. Mm -hmm. What makes a good businessman? Systems and processes and being driven. Inspiration is 10%. Perspiration is is 90%. If you follow that, 
you'll be successful. See when you do your shows and you're in all the newspapers now, like you're kind of a celebrity. So how how how, but how hard is that? I'll feel like people know you like because then you're out there in the public domain. Like, would you? Does it's it good. is it easier not know what people know in your business? Because if people know your business, they know you've got dough. Everybody must want from you. And how do you know who's real and who's not? So, is that a hindrance, or can is it good for business? Like, how does it work? Like when you're in, I'm certainly not a celebrity. Far from it. No, no. But what I've embraced is notoriety for what I do. And why have I embraced it? Because it's free publicity. And free publicity saves me advertising in newspapers. I'm directing traffic to my websites. So when somebody Googles me now, or they happen to watch this podcast, they want to know what I do. What do they mean? What does Wildcrest do? What does Varun Motorhome Hi do? All of a sudden, I'm directing traffic to my websites. It's free advertising. And a lot of people might frown upon that. But the truth is, that's why I do it. Do, do I feel it makes a difference in my personal life? Absolutely. And I swear, if I wasn't getting those benefits out of it to the business, I would never do it. Because I believe a private life is a happy life. What is your website? I mean, just plug them straight away. Wildcrest Parks, mm -hmm. Varun Motorhome Hire, uh, Wildcrest Events, um, Best Park Home Finance. The list goes on. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is for us, um, business is key. And do you know something, what I would say, what I love to see? What we don't do, James, in this country, and don't take this as if I'm rubbing your back. Take it as a fact. You're a credit, and don't realise it, you're a credit to the British business field because you've not gone down there and gone, right, I want to go. You've gone to some real diverse characters in business and shown that success can come from anywhere, not just one place. We don't do enough in this country to celebrate our business people and our entrepreneurs. You're an entrepreneur. You're out there doing it. That takes willpower. That takes getting, we, none of us have every good day. It takes determination to get up every morning and keep plugging it. And that we're not being celebrated enough. What we celebrate is sports people, actors, musicians. Our staple diet 20 years ago in this country was Coronation Street and EastEnders. They're all committing suicide and going skiing. <laughs> you know, come on. Yeah. Come on. We mm. want to see some success here. We want to show that everybody can be successful in any which way. You're successful. But keeping it successful is difficult. It's a different ball game. What makes you happy now? Success. Does it? Yeah. And you've got that in a fucking bundle. Well, so you can see that with a smile on <laughs> your face. Uh, but again, like to, how do you, like you says there, how do you maintain it, Alfie? Is that that? moment where you were homeless that you never wanted to lose it again to keep going keep I, th I think pushing anybody that gets above their station i don't have a lot of time for i really don't because anything can happen to anybody at any time and i always try to say especially to my son and uh to him i said look you never know what's around the corner we never know what's coming. And you meet the same people on the way up as what you would do on the day, way down. You want to be waved at on the way up and you need a hand on the way down. So make sure you polite them politely and correctly both ways. Yeah. How is it having a son? Like how much pressure do you, because he's such a good guy, man, like he's got the world at his feet, but how much added pressure do you think it is for someone when their dad is so successful? I think it's more difficult for Alfie than it's ever been for me. And the reason I do, he suffers more criticism than I do. The amounts of times that I see on social media that he's had it given to him, and let me tell you this for what it's worth, not a dollar. Not a dollar. Help? Of course. Advice? Of course, 
Will I go with him and help him with the business? Of course. A loan? Of course. With repayment terms. Because that's the real world. Is there beyond that? You know, you need to make your own way. The hardest thing in life is making a choice. And that choice is this. Am I hard on my kids? Or do I give my kids what I didn't have? And that's a real dilemma. Because do you know what the easiest thing is? I want them to have more than me. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. Because somebody's going to come along and take it off of them. Look, if you look at the amount of lottery winners that end up staying lottery winners, is minute. That's because it's one thing getting it. It's another thing keeping it. And the most important thing is to learn both. You picked it up earlier when you said, when you were saving Alfie, how did you get to the investment? And that's a hard choice to realise that money's a tool and it has to go to work. It's a soldier. That money works for you. You have to decide, is your money a prisoner that you have to house and feed or is it a soldier that conquers and wins. Mm-hmm. How do you find the balance, I'll feel it, to being giving them a life that you never had to then spoiling them? Do you know what I mean? Like to understanding the value of money and understanding to go out and get it yourself because you've lived it, you've been working since it, but as a parent, like, I'm so soft, but I understand, like, wash those dishes and then you can get something or do something, clean the house or wash the car, like... And the more about it, but I feel bad about it. But can it, I, can yeah. I, can I, here's my view. Mm-hmm. And you may not like this. Yeah. I don't believe in rewarding mm-hmm. children for chores. Yeah. The reason being, what you're doing is showing them the X washing the dishes for say five pounds or whatever, is that's the monetary value to do a job. Mm-hmm. We want to create business people and entrepreneurs. Not everybody can be that. And you can be successful as a manager. You can be successful as a doctor. You can be successful in any other field as well. But from my perception, what I like to see is, okay, if you wash the dishes and pack the dishes, you get a pound for washing them, a pound for packing them. Do you know something? You get an extra 50 pence for non-breakage. All of a sudden, you're now creating structure and system Mm -hmm. and procedure. So now they're thinking like a businessman. Mm -hmm. More profit. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be fucking skint, Alfie. I'll need to start putting out three podcasts a week. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, how how much pressure comes on to your life? Do you feel pressure? Are you at a stage where you just think, I'm I'm okay? I'm, I'm at pressure every day. I run my businesses like they're bankrupt. I'm serious. Since that time from... I run them like they're bankrupt. And that keeps you head above water and... and Keeps us sharp. Keeps my team sharp. I'm a very blessed man. I have some phenomenal people that are around me. To mention just a few, Wazim Hanif, David Sunderland, Zabaya, Ian Farr, Catherine Disney, my PA... Uh, misuse in marketing like I'm, I'm calling those people out and there are many 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 more mm-hmm. you know uh, David Masters Nick Haywood I've got some phenomenal Darren Busby these people that work with me I get to stand on their shoulders and take the glory of what they're doing but what I have done is created a dream of what we're doing what they're sharing in because I really believe we're changing the face of affordable homes and I want to do it worldwide. I want to do it worldwide. We'll do it worldwide. And I categorically will be the biggest park home operator in the world. Not, is it, I will. How many park homes do you have now? Currently we have 97. By the end of this year, we'll have 108. And we're currently at 16,000 residents across the UK. What? So at 16,000 park homes, what's your target to hit? Uh, we don't have a target. Just a limitless? It's a limitless, it's a limitless, well, sorry, I'll rephrase that. We do have targets. Our next target is 100. Mm-hmm. We know we're in, in line to su- 
surpass that. Our next target is 100. When I hit that 100, I'll then put another goal, not target, I'll put a goal in place. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, if you think of this as a football match, um, the, it's never over till the season's over and we're still playing the game. So our next goal is 100 parks. We're at 97. We know we're going to surpass that by the end of the year. We're going to be at 108. Um, the next target will be maybe 125. We'll hit that. But there's, if you ask me what's our substantiated end goal, there isn't one. Mm -hmm. It's limitless. America, where we want to be. Europe, well, look, our, our goal that we need to achieve beyond is beyond 220 parks because that's the biggest park operator and they're in America. Used to be some watch communities. I think it's somebody else now. Mm -hmm. So when you, a park home then for anybody that doesn't know, what is a park home? What's in it? What's the vibe like? Is it just like a caravan park? Like, how does it operate? A mobile home park started as a touring caravan park, a caravan that you put behind your car and tow. Then it became a static caravan, a caravan that's static. In other words, it's a big caravan that sits on a park, doesn't ever really move. Then it became a mobile home. And that became a home that you live in all year round. Then it became a park home. And they started to look like bricks and mortar bungalows. Then it became a park home bungalow, which is what we have now. And they're homes that are prefabricated homes, built in a factory, delivered on site. They're on a chassis, but are bricks round at the bottom. So to the naked eye, you'd think they're a bungalow and you're living on a like-minded bungalow estate. And I'll say this to you, is it for everybody? No, it's not. But every resident that we have I can absolutely categorically say 97% of our residents are very happy. You've always got the small minority that are not, but I'm not here to please everybody. I'm here to please most of the people. Can you buy one and rent it out? Of course you can. I love holiday homes, man. I love what, that nature and good vibes and good people. And I genuinely love all that stuff. Look. This is what I would say to you is we're living in a, in a society today where we want it now. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the government is against this, the government wants you to mortgage your home, pay for your home, be in your home when you're retired and die and give them 40%. They don't want you to sell your home, free up your capital, buy a park home and go off and live your life and sail around the world on world cruises and have a new Mercedes in the drive. Because you're spending their money. Mm -hmm. You're spending their 40%. So for me, this is a model that is categorically the solution. I'm not, you didn't see me use the word social housing. It's affordable housing. See, when you create something like that and it's growing every day, like how many people go, okay, I'm going to try that. Like, We've got a waiting list. Mm -hmm. This may surprise you of 325 people. And I checked this this morning because I knew I would bring it out. Yeah. 325 people that have paid deposits waiting for a, a plot or a home to come available on our parks. 325 people paid their money down waiting for their home to come on. Now that's a phenomenal, you, I'm, yeah, that's like saying you're going in the car garage to buy a car and he's saying, no, you've got, to, you've got to go on a waiting list. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, and I know that does happen with certain cars, but that shows you that it's wanted. It shows that what we're doing, the public is behind. Yeah. So it's a win-win. It's a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. How do you... Was there ever, did you ever take the eye off, eye off the prize though? Like sometimes, like how do you celebrate? How do you enjoy life? Like, or is it just constant work daily because you're still, you're scared that you end up with a double mattress in the back of a van again? No, uh, uh, to be fair with you, that's, that's not what comes across my mind. Of course I celebrate, but my life is a celebration. I never thought I'd ever get to where I am now. I never thought that I'd be the person that I am now. I never thought that I'd be blessed enough to be able to do the things that I do. So 
I'm walking on water. I'm just making sure that the canoe is next to me when I fall in the water. Mm -hmm. You know, be aware that we're not geniuses. Be aware that we're, you know, not flawless people. And I'm certainly not. But I'm celebrating. I'm loving life. I'm, I feel like a Premier League football player that's just won, you know, the World Cup every day. How? Because I didn't think I'd be here not doing this. Yeah, how do you keep that mindset though? That, because I know people, it's maybe only worth maybe 50 grand, 100 grand. They wear all design their, their clothes and they think they're Billy Big Ball looks like they seriously think that and obviously yourself what you've got what you've achieved and to be sitting here so humble and and presenting yourself so well and putting things across that it simplifies people as well for business the right things to do the wrong things to do that how do you keep that mindset james it's not for me to criticize anybody for where they are in life mm -hmm. and how they feel about it but the one thing that i would say is this there's a synergy that's always put around fake it until you make it i'm sorry Horse manure. No, no. Get up, show up, dress up, and most importantly, work up. You won't have to fake it then. Yeah, that's true. You won't have to fake it then. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? Because it doesn't matter where you are on the ladder of success. And remember, success is me measured in many different ways, not just financial, but it doesn't matter where you are on the ladder. You know, if people see you put the effort in, they want to be there for you. Mm -hmm. They want to be alongside you because they can see that you've got minerals and that comes in many different ways. Yeah. How do you, is it, does it become a lonely journey as well, success, to be the heights you're at and to keep believing in yourself? Because you, every time you've just, you ju it just seems as if you've just kept leveling up and leveling up and leveling up, but there's no stopping you to what you want to achieve. I, I Like I said, success is a journey. Mm -hmm. If I start looking at it as a destination, then I start changing my mindset. As long as I remember that it's a journey, as long as I remember that my journey is not over until the last breath, then I can keep enjoying it. I can keep doing what I'm doing. I can keep pushing forward. And as long as I keep telling people, please don't trust me, please check for me, please make sure that I've not made a mistake, isn't that I'm doubting myself? It's actually become becoming smarter because the more people that I've got checking, the less mistakes I seem to make. It's amazing yeah. that, isn't it? How do these other travellers treat you? Um, do you know something? I'm the same person I was 30 years ago as I am today. So no different. That's a good thing because I know a lot of travellers, man, that are loyal to the core. They are loyal, but yeah. they're fucking crazy. Yeah. They're but, so crazy, but, man. But do you know what I would say to you is, is... Being a traveller is like having an extended family. We're, you know, we're all cousins. And I guarantee to you, you bump into travel, you say you was with Alfie, but that's my cousin. <laughs> because somewhere down the line, we will be. Yeah. Well, how was that watching your son fighting? How, is, how hard is that as a father who... I think I can relate to every father mm -hmm. that's ever seen their boy get in a, in a, in a, in a, in a boxing ring. You want to be punched yourself. You don't want your son to be punched. Mm. It's it's like you're in the ring yourself. Um, uh, I've got a partner, uh, um, two partners, funny enough, one called Simon O'Donnell, one called Simon McDonough, and both of their boys are boxing at the minute. And uh, both of them can have a fight. And I looked at them when their boys were boxing the other day and I physically saw them like they were shaking. Do you follow me? Like yeah. different people. When your son's in the ring, you want to be in there for him. Mm -hmm. When do you think you'll go to America? Um, hopefully January or February. Why haven't you been there already? We have. Oh, have you got stuff yeah, over yeah. there? I didn't know um, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about understanding the market and the timing of going there at the moment everything globally is on a high and the problem is on the highs that we're in now things can only go one way and i personally think within the next 18 months we're going to have a terrible recession um and i think that's going to happen in the u.s as well 
So I want to be buying into the market on a low level and I don't want to be in there at the high levels having to lick my wounds and work through it. I want to be buying at a low level and then working up so mm -hmm. it's increasing in value. That's my view. Where do you get your buzz from now, Alfie? Is it like, do you still have a target? See, selling hold homes, you go, yeah, that was a good day. Like, if I get views in a certain podcast, I go, that was a good day, but the buzz goes, I need more. I yeah, need yeah. more. Like, what's your, like, gives you that satisfaction? See, firstly, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 right, firstly is obviously seeing the company grow and looking at the stats of how it's going forward. Secondly, seeing my children progress on a journey of their own as they're carrying on. And most importantly, reevaluating myself when I'm talking to people like yourself, James, because the feedback that you give me, I then take away and reanalyze. And I see where I need to correct myself. And that's the buzz it gives me because it means that I'm genuinely learning all the time. Not necessarily becoming a better person mm -hmm. because we have to fail to grow. Mm -hmm. Seeing you've got the wheels in motion and you're, you're becoming successful and you're working hard and millions are coming in. Like, is, there a, was there a, is there a point in your life you go, I could retire here? Or is there, is there everything's pinnacle moments of your life where everything's up and down yeah. but when you're really doing well like people are estimating you're worth over a billion like that's unbelievable there's only seven billion people on the planet and to be in that thousand like that just shows you the caliber of guy that you are but how do you yeah but let, let, moments in your life well let me say this to you firstly the success hasn't always hasn't been created by me i'm just the orchestrator and there is a lot of people that, as I've said, I've got to take the credit to stand on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I don't have that money. I wish I did. That money is invested into businesses, assets, and generating. So let's not lose sight that I still live a normal life. I don't live any different. But could I sell up and could I retire? Absolutely. But what would be the point of life? What would be the point of taking life and saying, I don't want to do anything. I just want to go and do the things. I want to do the things that create a buzz. I don't want to grow old. I want to grow old disgracefully. <laughs> Not gracefully. Come on, where's the fun in that? <laughs> where, do you go in it? where do you go for the future? Like, where is Alfie Best go? Like, you, you seem to have we done are it all already. No, we haven't done it all. I've just scratched the surface. Just getting started. I've just scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. Do you know one of the greatest blessings that you can have as a person is when you meet certain people that you gel with and you don't happen to see those people, but when you see them again, you're the same person to them, but you've grown a little bit where they can help you and you can help them. Whereas I've seen a lot of people they meet people and they never want to see him again. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I've been blessed. I've been blessed. And I've got five or six very close friends. Um, uh, one of them called Big Paul. And I can honestly say he's the most true blue man I've ever met in my life. And uh, he has been another person that's helped me on my road and my journey. Um, yeah, no question about it. Do you take time off? Do you travel? Like, how yeah, do you look, get some downtime? But, but I work. Even if I'm when getting, you're on holiday? Yeah, of course. Look, I've got um, a business in Barbados. I went there. I couldn't. I thought, oh, Jesus Christ, I've got work. So I set up a business and now we have uh, a business there called Barbados VIP Villas. And we own about 10 villas there and we rent them out. And, you know, I love it. But I go there, I don't want to sit on a deck chair and get a suntan, you know, because otherwise I'd be sitting there thinking, how can I invent a sun cream that's, you know, better and want to sell it? That's my, it's not that I don't switch off. It's, that's what I love doing. I love working. Mm -hmm. Am I sometimes too busy? Yes. And that, that can be a problem. Why? Because you need to focus. You need to focus because without focus, you can't get to a spearheaded point to push it forward. 
must focus. Mm -hmm. How many kids you got, Alfie? Two. And how does that affect them by being so driven? Like, because I'm always on the road and my kids are back in Glasgow, so part of me says I do this for my kids, but part of me thinking my kids probably need me more than ever. They're at a critical age, so I'm, I'm in constant conflict with myself because I'm trying to create to give them nice things and we can do things together, but then time is precious, man. I haven't, and this is an honest, I haven't seen my kids for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Metaphorically. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm, I haven't seen anybody metaphorically. I've seen them when I've been working. It's a horrible thing to say to you, mm -hmm. but it's true. So how do I find the balance in that then? Like, because I'm always, I need I'm, to go to America. I, need to, I don't I'm, need to do anything, but to go levels and above and beyond because I'm so hungry for success. I'm so hungry to succeed. Like, Let me be really honest with you, James. Mm -hmm. I'm not a successful person in every walk of my life. Where family is concerned, I can't say that I've nailed it because I put the business first. Um, and... We have to know our own flaws. Have I been a good father? No. Have I been a good provider? Yes. Have I been a good teacher? I think so. Have I been hard? Yes. Would I go back and change some of those things? Yes. But we can't change the past. We can only embrace it and learn for the future. So now I try to be a better friend if that makes sense. Yeah. Because being a father, being a mother, is one of the most difficult jobs in the world. And all you can do, in my opinion, is be there for your children and try to leave them ready for the world. Mm -hmm. I've seen fathers that are much better fathers than me, had much more attentive time for their children. But they enjoyed doing that they didn't do it because it was the right thing to do they enjoyed doing it whereas i was didn't i didn't want my children to be in the same position i was in but i'll give you a quick story yeah my father said to me i said dad what are you working for come on you don't need to work as hard as you're doing now come on give you know well i've got to haven't i i said this is not so long ago as well i said why is that now, my dad owns three mobile home parks, three small mobile home parks, what he's, and his money is blood money. It's blood blisters. He's 76 years old, works every day to this day, and it's manual work. Still goes out digging holes, laying bases, laying drains, he's a builder. Every day. Drives a van, every day goes to work and works on the tolls. Not there drinking, on the tolls. So I said to him, I said, Dad, I said, you know, I'd rather you and Mum enjoy, you know, the time. Well, like I said, I'm working for you and our son. I've got to make sure you, I'll leave you with something. I said, well, I think I'm all right. I said, you know, I think I'm a... He went, nah, nah, nah. I went, well, I'll tell you what. Give it to me now. He went, what? I said, give it to me now. I said, surely you want the benefit of giving it to me now going to be more tax efficient i said give it to me now well what, what are you going to do with it i said i'm going to spend it I'm going to cash it and spend it he went well i can't do that <laughs> so uh, that inset mind mm -hmm. of where we all want you know sometimes it's an excuse uh, do you see a lot of yourself and your dad yeah but my dad's one of the hardest working men harder than i work is the hardest working man i know Honestly. And can you see why he keeps wanting to work? Because obviously that'll be you. You know that's going to be you at 76, yeah, 80. But, but, but you know, he looks 50. Mm -hmm. He looks 50. Yeah. So what I would say is I'm an expert in retirement. And do you know what I say to all of my residents, the one I meet? Please don't ever retire. The body can't do 30, 40 years and then shut down. Hmm. The mind goes. I have a charity called the Wild Crest Foundations. And I'm implored to eradicate dementia. 
and I have set a goal that we are going to start to raise enough money to build a medical research centre where we're going to fund wholly and solely to help find a cure for dementia because I've seen a lot of it and I've seen what it does not to the person, to the people around them. It's not an illness that just affects one person. It's an illness that affects the whole family where they've got this person that was a superstar, but he's basically dead inside a living body mm -hmm. that's not functioning. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you then have an outside source person telling them about stories when you're thinking, is this that real person? They're like a ghost living there. And with the, the foundation that we have, we, we pay for everything from the company. The company pays the Wildcrest Foundation for all of its employees. Any money that's donated to that cause, we make sure it goes directly to the cause. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. We pay for everything. That's about, from a charitable point of view, the only thing that I've really become. And we've raised money for different causes, but that's the thing that's really spiked me that I felt needed changing because it wasn't just about the person. It was actually about the family. Did you lose someone close to it? I didn't, but I've seen so many of my residents that have had their family and it's affected them. Mm -hmm. And they've gone through their savings trying to help them, paying for them to be looked after in care homes and such forth. So yeah. I thought it's about time. It really affects people in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And the more I saw it, the more I felt that some, somebody like me, and I don't shout about it too much because I don't want to be seen as a do-gooder. I want to do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, yeah. James. How many businesses have you got, Alfie? 17. 17? Mm -hmm. Still a lot, man. It's That's a lot of businesses. So my fucking people it's struggle to run one. Like, how do you let's stay on that path like 17 businesses obviously you've got your routine I have a report, in that i have a report every single week from every single business and i spend one day analyzing each of those reports and their cash flow mm -hmm. as well as procedure so if it's not making cash flow do you sink the business or do you keep working at it till it does a business can only fail because it's got failed people in it mm -hmm. it is the it is down to the people. That's why an estate agent on one side of the road thrives. The other estate agent on the other side barely survives. It's the people. Do you think we're at a time with this, on this world now it's, it's easy to succeed or is it, do you think it's harder? I think it's easy if it's the right people. Again, it's just all down to the individual. Just down to the people. Yeah. Going forward for the future, brother, like, what's the plans? Where do you go? Global domination of the park home industry. Mm -hmm. That's it. And for anybody watching, it's maybe want to start off a business or their business is struggling. You've been there to being on your ass and losing it all, sleeping in the back of a van to then being one of the most successful men on this planet. Like, that's a big fucking, that's, that's a big thing to have on your shoulders, but it's true. Like, what advice would you give for that person? Start. Yeah. Don't wait. Mm -hmm. Start. Uh -huh. Any doubt that you have, analyse it, chew it over. But start. Time waits for no man. So make sure you're not waiting for it. Exactly, bro. Let's start. Alfie, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. No doubt a lot of people watching this will pick up a lot of tools and techniques why you keep succeeding, why you've never quit, and why you're successful, and why you're the man that you are. Like, would you like to finish up on anything? I wish everybody the best. It's been an absolute pleasure um, being on here with James. And I think I've learned as much as anybody else has thank you where can anybody get a hold of you we'll leave the links in your description for your websites and social medias what kind of stuff Alfie I'm on Instagram I'm on Facebook and I'm on um, uh, Twitter um, I'm Alfie Best Senior not Junior he gets the credit some of the time <laughs> <laughs> thanks Alfie God bless you brother thank thanks, you bro. take care good